inspiration would be is going to be in my friends of like the non men in my life. Like men are great, but uh, my dad died when he was really young. He was 30, I was three. And it was just me and my mom and my sister. She could have easily like curled up into a ball and just been like done. But I watched her put herself through college and like that for a while. And like making sure that like there was always loose juice in the fridge. that perseverance and then it spread to my sister and now my spouse who is also in my reading em davis and the, the three of them are kind of like my holy trinity in a way they just kind of keep me going because i see like the, the setbacks they've had and they've kept going so i'm always like well who am i to complain that x y and z so they're, they're, they're kind of the engine driving hello everyone good morning i'm naomi lorraine um playwright of <laughs> and this inspiration um, is off my mom. Uh, she is not an artist, she's in the medical field, but she took me to so much art when I was growing up, to the opera, and like we were these two black women in Little Rock, Arkansas, and these very um, majority white spaces, and she just made me feel so at home, and like she taught me that I belong everywhere, even if I didn't see my melanin reflected. And even when I went away to school, when I was pre med, and it up. <laughs> and she was shocked, the, but then I'm like, how could you be surprised? You would be used to be. I was to hope that mirror up to you and be able to make it a better situation altogether. So, definitely. Oh, I love that. I'm Michael Cheyenne. I am he, him, his. And I wrote the play, I wrote A Boz. Um, in which I play my mother, every gay man's dream. <laughs> and, um, uh, so I guess actually for this weekend, my pronouns are she, her, and her. Uh, and mom. Uh, I, uh, and yeah, yeah, I got, I'm going to say mom too. You know, for me, this play was really about stepping into my mother's shoes, like literally stepping into her shoes and, um, and, Im and embodying our relationship and, and sort of seeing things through her perspective, like, uh, yeah, sort of just taking taking on a different worldview, and um, that's been giving me a lot of life to sort of explore my family's history and what it means to put that history in my body. Uh, but yeah, moms. Um, my name is Brenda Johnson. My pronouns are she, her, hers, um, and I'm a co-creator, co-composer, and co-lyricist for Dr. Silver. Hi, I'm going to echo what's been coming down the line that I would say my my family and my friends uh, have been what's been inspiring me. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but it's been a weird couple of years. <laughs> and, uh, everything kind of fell away, specifically my professional opportunities where I normally make music, and that's what I felt connected to making music. And it just, the past couple of years have kind of reconfigured that for me, because when that falls away, I still have this desire to do it because it's how I engage with these communities and how I engage with actually been kind of the most transformative thing about the past couple of years is remembering that this is an important function of life and community no matter what, no matter what the structures look like outside of that. And it's been it's been a lot more joyful actually some of the creation that's happened than I have remembered. And, and returning to this process on the other side of that with my family, with my sister, she's my sister. Um, <laughs> there's this new spark in it. There's this new gratitude in it. I've been sitting on stage playing the show with Annika last night and we made eye contact and I was like, this feels different. This super different. Hi, Danica, for this big sister, other co creator, composer of uh, Dr. Silver. I'm not a morning person. <laughs> I'm also, like, quite sentimental because it's been such a profoundly joyful week, so I will be a bit emotionally volatile over here. I, I would uh, build on. It, it's so true, like, the, what everyone said about drawing inspiration from their family and what Britta just spoke of is so true. And I would say, I would add to that, that my biggest pull in this work is the excitement of creating family with people you just met. Like, when you make live art that you share with people in a lot of space, when it's at its best, you are suddenly so intimate with the people who are doing it with you, whether they're on stage with you or in the audience. And that is something I have learned in the last few years. And so 
getting to meet new people and then having this like, shortcut, this race track to feeling like I know them very, very closely. But like, the people who work with them and the people who have been here at festival walking shows, I forgot what a charge that is. It's like, it's so, so, so great to be with all of you. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love that. Humanity and nature. Yeah. Right? How we have to center uh, each other and center our love and center our inspiration when we gather to create. Uh, first question to Britta Naomi Spencer. What do you think the theater needs more of now? Britta Naomi or Spencer can start us off. Mm -hmm. Me. And it's so sad what an anomaly that this is. This idea that like we could all come out here for a week or so, turn off our brains to almost everything else and just write. Just having that peace of mind like just makes the art better. And then it gives us more opportunities to pay, not it, you know, to the idea of like to get a story like how to roll a one on stage is incredible. Let's try to pay them a living wage as well or get as close to it. Because if you know if, if everybody's still having to like you know work for pennies, I don't think it like does anybody any good, and it's not a healthy situation. So getting them on stage isn't enough. It's also about like getting folks a paycheck in a way that feels reasonable. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I mean I'm just going to echo what these people just said. But yeah, you work lots of it and meaningfully support it in a way that lets people have an abundant and thriving life. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, because I think that obviously the world is changing quickly and it's our job as artists to uh, lead the conversation with bravery. The answer to that is always going to be community. I don't know uh, any, uh, theater is always how I've engaged with community and I think there's a lot of healing that, that is uh, possible there. And if we can meet these moments that we're in, these complex moments that we're in through creation and community, meaningfully supportive creation <laughs> and community, uh, I think that is what Uh, Arnica, Michael, Christine, I'm curious about uh, a piece of advice you've been given that has shaped you. Sometimes it's a critique or a note. I trained as an actor, and uh, my teacher, Marcella Lorca, hit me with the most backhanded compliment of my life. <laughs> I was a senior, and we were working on Chekhov, and I, you know, and I hadn't worked with her yet, and we were doing it. Not, you know, I was, you know, I was doing. I thought I was brilliant. And <laughs> Marcella said to me, she said, "Hey, Javin, 98% of the people who see you will love it." 2%, including me, will go tricks. Oh, 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 <laughs> no tricks on my stage. And my whole world, like, I, it collapsed in on myself. And I had to like dig a little bit deeper to figure out what that note was about. So I'm curious, what's a piece of advice that has shaped you, Monica, Michael, or Christine? I, I will actually jump on what you just said, because one of my best pieces of advice came while I was in theater school. I also did my undergrad as an actor in classical acting conservatory. And my teacher, Ian Watson, who taught me Shakespeare, uh, he's since passed away, but he was like one of the best Shakespeare teachers in Canada, where we are from. And he gave me a piece of advice, which was that the best warm up, I'm like a perfectionist and 
a hard worker and a very neurotic artist in a lot of ways. And he was like, the best way to warm up to do your work is just to get in a good mood. So do whatever you have to do to feel good and get in a good mood. And that has been the best advice I've ever received <laughs> because if you show up in a good mood, you're gonna be able to share that with people you're working with and then you will all be at your best and on huh. your most like, profound creativity. So that's, that's my advice from Ian Yeah. You know, I, uh, as she says, no tricks on stage. I actually started out as a magician. It's <laughs> <laughs> form of theater. There are a lot of tricks on stage. <laughs> yeah, the of the world. Oh my God. Okay, so that's too scandalous for a 9 a.m. panel. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, but actually, uh, you know, I'm, so I'm playing my mother, and uh, I worked with, with Luis Alfaro, who's just an incredible um, mentor and, and teacher and playwright, and just really here. And we did a workshop together at Lambda Literary, and he taught me that playwriting is um, it's sort of an act of channeling, and it's a ritual, right? He sort of introduced me to this idea. Um, he introduced me to the work of, of Maria Irene Fornes and her methods, which are all about sort of dreaming your way into a play. And that's how I really got into this piece, into Avaz. Um, was sort of channeling my mother, literally. And then to see her in the, she came and saw the show. Um, and that was really terrifying. Oh. You know, we sat her like in the second row, third row back. She walks in, sits in the front row center, <laughs> arms crossed, what you got, baby? <laughs> okay, wonderful. Um, so that was really scary, but, but it did feel like an act of sort of really embodying and channeling her and then to, to watch her watching me play her and talk about her son was like this out of body experience. Um, so I am currently not in my body. I am just, uh, I don't know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a vessel for something and on this panel. So yeah, but it was, so I guess it's like the channeling and bringing that energy both to the writing and then to the performing. Um, yeah. And then I guess that makes you more available to to life too, right? When you're when you're in an experience, you're sort of able to like be super present for it. Yeah. Like you were saying, yeah. Like you were saying. Mm -hmm. Christine. Yeah, I I felt a real turning point when um, uh, the Queen of Spejos got passed on three times by three different directors, who all said this isn't the play. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and you know, I was still in my twenties, and I I I think I would have really collapsed earlier, but. This time I, I suddenly was like, who are you to decide? Even people who are my mentors who run institutions, who are you to decide what is a play, what is a play? And you know, in Canada right now, indigenous artists are leading the way, bringing ceremony on stage, uh, oral storytelling, multimedia, uh, remixing you know, traditional forms of theater and indigenizing it. And this is all work that people said, that's not a play. Um, and so that's gatekeeping. And uh, I was so grateful that I finally, you know, buoyed by a huge community of resistance that come many, many decades before I started making theater, kind of was like, no, who are you to decide? This is, this is a play. And, um, and that also gave me fire through the pandemic with all the things that people were like, it's not theater if it's online, it's not theater if it's mass, it's not, sure it is, sure it is, if we're here together, whether it's over, you know, online or friends who are listening now, or might be listening now, you know, a couple hours, a couple days from now, or the people in this room, that that spark, you know, there's nobody who can say what it is or what it isn't. And so I, I was really glad that that this isn't a play. You know, you get my teeth out the safest way. <laughs> That's what new work does, right? You're always trying to change and alter the form of what we know. And sometimes people are resistant to it, uh, which I always think is amazing and it takes such courage. So a round of applause for these courageous women. I'm gonna go further down this road around criticism, right? You all are uh, working on new plays. You've all heard a uh, critique. Um, uh, an actor told me once that there are three things you go through when you get a note from a director. The first one is, oh my God, I'm awful. Did you, oh, like, I, I didn't believe you didn't understand my choice, I'm a bad actor. The second one is like, I don't know who you think you're talking to. Yes. <laughs> and the third one is, wait, what is the note? 
And, I, and, they t and you know, he said to me that the, the, those three things never go away, but you got to move through them faster. So I'm curious, anybody, when you get critique, I mean, what is it? How does it feel? How do you like to be spoken to? Like, that's one thing I've had to learn how to uh, work with one of my playwright collaborators. Like, uh, he's like, you need to start here, and then you need to go there. What do you need, anybody, when you're getting critique? Well, I mean, a really big thing you learn as you do more new work is at figuring out how to ask for what you need mm -hmm. in a critique and being very specific about that because you really did identify, you always go through those three stages. And if you're going to make yourself go through that, you need to be very clear about how you engage with it and what you expect from different people. You know, because everyone's coming to the work from a different place with a different set of lenses. And I, I don't know if it's a clear answer, but I've, I've learned, like I get in fights with my fiance every time he comes to one of my shows because I forget to ask him what I need afterwards. And uh, when you're that vulnerable, inevitably, you're going to be really pissed off no matter what. <laughs> so I think, uh, yeah, being clear about that is, is the key, if that's an answer at all. I feel like following like the performance of anything like I work on, whether it's a reading or like an actual show, I hate going out to the lobby after because when somebody's like, good job, I'm like, I don't believe you. Yes. <laughs> they're like, I have some notes. I'm like, don't kill my buzz. So like, nothing you can say is going to be helpful. I will, I, will, I will say like during this process, uh, dramaturg Jerry Patch and director David Ivers were both being incredibly kind and they were like, have you considered? And they were asking in questions. They were being very soft and I was like, guys, I have. I'm going to be up to 3 a.m. rewriting this thing, like, what's broken? You know what I mean? And so I just, like, I finally, and they, once they understood how I needed to hear it, they said, then Ivers was like, well, I demand you, you know, <laughs> and he kind of played my game with me. So it was like, it was, sometimes I think just having it like a, almost like a blunt hammer is sometimes incredibly helpful just so you can get right to the heart of it and you're not dancing around the note. Yeah. For me, it's just in the I, with my critique in mind, like, whatever they feel like isn't working for the piece, we'll go into another piece. I have it, like, whenever I'm editing anything, I have this other document open that I move it to. I delete nothing because something from this will go into that and will create this. Like, it's not, you know, it will just become a manifest into another film. And so, what I've gotten from Fran, from my director of select, Fran was my dramaturg, we had a very, like, joyous room so like we would all hear it and just cock our head and be like <laughs> and i was like you heard it too and she was like okay you heard it. like this this right here what is like what you need like it was the spirit of like honesty and like let's carve this out a little bit more i see the angel but like mm -hmm. just like it, it's ears too big <laughs> let's, let's trim it down a little bit so it's just that joyous generosity of like we're getting close to, to the actual thing, you know? It was, so it didn't feel like negative, but it was taking anything away. It was like, we are we're carving this out and we're getting more specific. And they made it really like sexy. Like really specific, <laughs> yeah. you know? So it was really, it's, it's the spirit and we're giving it. Yeah. I'll say, you know, my mother is my biggest critic. <laughs> she came up to me after the show. You know, honey, I have some notes. <laughs> so Christina Wong was our dramaturg, and she's absolutely brilliant. But I was telling David Ivers, I said, we need to add uh, under dramaturg, Christina Wong and mom. <laughs> she, like, she was bringing the dramaturgy. Um, you know, but I think what it, what it showed me, right, is like, you know, as, as, as a playwright, like, my job is also to be honest, right? I have to tell the truth in the play. And so I'm going to be accountable to, you know, to my mother, yes, but also to my community, to, to other theater makers, like this is like, this is truth telling 101, right? So, um, and hopefully to do it in a, in a fun sort of theatrical way. Um, and you know, she is very funny, she is larger than life, but also there's some real, um, I mean, she, she faces some ghosts of her past, right, in this play. So it's like balancing that and, um, and telling, telling that story with care. You know, being very, um, I think, I think my experience, you said, you said someone said generosity, and like, that's kind of what it feels like, yeah, that was you, she was like, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, but you are a very generous uh, writer and, and, um, and spirit, but, 
but yeah, you know, bringing that generosity into the room and then um, also sort of just like staying true to that to that spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just such a vital part of the process is choosing your collaborators, having a few people on either side of you where the, there's like two things that are abundantly clear is that you have a common goal that's just about making the work as truthful as possible. It's not about anyone getting a certain amount of credit for that work or any reviews or anything. It's just this is a shared common goal mm -hmm. and that you, no matter what, can tell each other the truth because you can always feel when you work with a collaborator where they're like, sorry, just to catch you saying the truth, <laughs> which makes me go more bananas than, like, because then I'll be like, oh my God, you just hated me, must have been an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but those people can then help you to filter. And early in my writing journey, I would just kind of like lift my eyebrows like this and be like, never would anyone tell me anything about anything I'm like, I'm just learning. Which is yeah. useful. Yeah. Like it's it's important to be able to listen to what listen to what the next helpful thing is and be able to set the other things aside. And for me, that the part of that has been figuring out how to have the best co-writers next to me and the best directors and the best dramaturgs for me, where that where that understanding of truth telling is always there and the shared goal is always there. Yeah, you've all spoken about the dramaturg and your collaborators, uh, which is so important. You don't do this alone, and you know that. Um, and one of the things South Coast Repertory is always about with PPF is like, we're trying to get you the director, you want the dramaturg you want, and we've heard a little bit about dramaturgs, and so I'm gonna hit you with a lightning round, okay? Three words that describe your ideal director. Three words that describe your ideal director. We're starting with Annika and we're working our way down. Right? Three words that describe your ideal director. I'll keep repeating so you can keep thinking. Uh, three words, ideal director. Funny, smart, cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, honest, uh, work with from integrity. That's not one word. Work from integrity. That's great. Hi, so what, how do you use integrity in such a sort of way? You know, good person. Honest, <laughs> good, funny. You gotta laugh if you have to stay up till 4 a.m. <laughs> uh, my DD, Moritz von Stupnig. <laughs> <laughs> Open-ended question for all of you. What do you, um, when you uh, are watching actors do your work, what's the greatest um, mistake or error or note you always have? Hey, this needs to drive. Hey, this is more joyful. What's the thing that you always want to offer up to anybody who might do your work? I'll tell you one of the best things about writing music is that you get to give your performers a line read. Like you <laughs> write the exact way they have to perform that crazy text. Yeah. And so it's a very simple thing for me. If they don't sing the line right, that's all I care about. <laughs> but it, it's a very controlling uh, position to be in, be composer. <laughs> don't be like, oh, we're telling the truth. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Anything you're looking for? I, I feel like, like I, I really like, and I know several of us write really bouncy, like fast d dialogue. And I think the thing that I always find myself saying is like, it's not about talking fast. It's about picking up your cues fast, right? Because even if we can't articulate it as an audience member, it will sound like normal speak mm. in rhythm, not in speed. Mm. So that's always the note I find myself giving. Yeah. One note I, I give to my comedy, you know, quick wit, all that stuff is stakes. Mm. Like, even though she's going on and on about this thing and she sounds like it's just doesn't matter, it is life or death. Like, this is the love of her life. Like, you're about to lose everything. So, like, it's just, I need it heightened, but grounded. Because, you know, truth has no size. You can be huge, but it has to be grounded in truth. And I just, the stakes, you got to remember the stakes, stakes, stakes. Mm. Yeah, I love that. I, I think, like, you know, well, so, so Moritz and I have been working together for a while now. And um, what drew us together, I think, was the comedy. Like, he's a brilliant comedy director. And, you know, I, li I like writing comedies. Um, but I think it's like, the humor in a play is really important for me because 
Um, you know, we love to laugh, we love a good joke, we love a good punchline, but it's also like the humor sort of, I think, open, can open you up, right, as an audience. Like, it, you know, if you have um, a big laugh and then you have a big gut punch, right, but sort of adjacent to one another, um, or, or a big gut punch and then a big laugh, like I think that's equally powerful. I think it opens you up to experience the play, to experience what the play is trying to do and say um, in a way that you might not otherwise, right? I think it's a, it's a, um, it's sort of just a very particular experience. So I'm always about, you know, um, I want I want my plays to feel like parties. You know, I want them to feel like you're being welcomed into a space and being, uh, and, and to feel, feel fun, right? Like, you, I, I come to the theater, um, you know, I think I, I just like a very entry level, like we want to have a fun experience, but I think, you know, when you bring the comedy in a very intentional way, you can sort of like, you know, really go, go deep. Um, yeah, sort of, like, sort, sort of what you were saying about stakes, like sort of opens you up to those stakes. Like, well, isn't it interesting, like sometimes the laugh will come from, especially with plays like y'all's, the laugh will not come from, this is a funny situation, sometimes it's really dramatic, but we laugh at like, recognizing ourselves <laughs> and we're like oh my gosh that reminds me of right so there's that lack of recognition yeah which is why mine is is don't take me or my work that seriously mm. <laughs> and i tend yes. to write about really heavy stuff but i'm like you know it's like the way we all walk around we're like you know just like trauma like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know just the creep you know whatever <laughs> um, and the the less you take it seriously i think the more there's room for that projection where you go oh that person's laughing through that yeah, yeah. Okay. thank you. Uh, oh. you know, now, now it's going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you, I mean, our main language is music. When you teach music, ever since you know, I, we were we direct, you know, children's choir, the thing you say is strong and wrong. It's always most valuable as a creator. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not sure about it yet, like step in and show us what you've got. Show us where logistically, when you're teaching music, you have to be able to hear if they know it or not. But also, I think that spreads into the this dramatic work we're doing, and specifically in workshop that I always appreciate from the performer just boldly stepping in and making a choice and being vulnerable in that with us as we figure it out and paying back to the room where it is the work, like boldly step into a strong and wrong for choir and for the class. <laughs> Even your notes rhyme is what I'm hearing. Like, well, I'm a rhyme. <laughs> Uh, Rita, Annika, Michael, uh, what playwright or artist do you think we should know about or who we should be revisiting? Uh, what is an artist that either there's someone that inspires you that's working right now, other than the illustrious panel that you've assembled we've got here, uh, or is there someone you, we, you think we should be revisiting, something, something we all uh, should be uh, uh, taking off the shelf and looking at again? Oh, man. <laughs> Um, Stoked. That's yes. such a serious question. Yeah. Um, I, it's, I, it, it's not the precise answer to this mm -hmm. question, but my greatest living celebrity role model is Jodi Mitchell, and um, it's not about revisiting or even looking to her. We're all looking at her all the time, but um, I, she's been on my mind lately. <laughs> <laughs> Inspiring all over again, and it's not like anyone forgot about Sondheim, but I, he has shown me how much a song can do and how much a song can say about people or places and the way that they are. So, if you haven't investigated Sondheim, <laughs> <laughs> I recommend it. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> Up and coming, yeah. Yeah, for me, it's hard to name one. Um, you know, I mentioned Maria Irene Fornes, who was just a brilliant, um, a brilliant playwright and a teacher, and her play, you know, she, she had this, this daydreaming method that I talked about, and I think it really drops you into the play. Like, you're just sort of, boom, you're there. Um, but also, like, I think, you know, there are just so many playwrights that, uh, so I was in, in grad school in, in that Wellman program at Brooklyn College, and, um, you know, some of the playwrights that I worked with were just, like, totally, cha you know, changing the form, I was, I, I'll name just like Nadia Hassan and Noel Vignas and Caitlin Kenny and Bailey Williams, like just brilliant, brilliant writers. Deepa Parohit, oh my God, now I have to name them all. 
Um, <laughs> but, you know, just brilliant writers who are um, sort of bringing in a new wave of like, when it, when it comes to form, like thinking about form and how form and content sort of uh, align or, or misalign. And um, yeah, so lots of, I mean, I'm just sort of like, yes, I love all playwrights. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, I always think it's important, you know, uh, the most powerful thing is when people speak your name in rooms you're not in, right? Yeah. And that's how so many of us get access and that's how so many people find out about us is that somebody is speaking our name in a room we're not in and that opportunity is being open. And then it's a reminder to revisit the ones who came before. Our art form is passed down, you know, we are inspired by these people. And so I love that idea. Thank you for those opportunities to hear. Naomi, a Spencer, and Christine, uh, often in my EDI and anti-racism work, I ask people about their beloved community. Meaning, who is that community that you sort of um, uh, care about? Who do you sort of think about when you're creating art? So I'm curious, like, who would you describe as your beloved community? Who is the uh, audience that you are writing for? Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two people. My mother and my partner. And myself, like it's the, it's the three of us. So if I write something, I was like, will it make them laugh? Will it will make them cry. Will it make them think. Mm -hmm. Those two disagree, and they're very different people, you know, ideology wise and all that good stuff. But they represent so many different facets of the black community, which also is my audience. Like I write for everyone, but specifically people that are descendants of American slavery, specifically. But why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> because I feel like there's there's so much to say, and I do feel like specifically with that that community, the conversation and the story is usually about how they became that community, i.e., the enslavement. And there's so much joy. There's so much more to that life, to the history. I don't know if you watched The Gilded Age, but they're, you know, they have a character who's black, but they're in the North in the 1800s, and they're not a slave, and they have money, and they have gold, and they have joy, and they have death, and they have a life that is not, you know, completely, um, completely just on the, the plantation or like on the, the square that is white America. And I think that there's just so many more stories that you could tell about those people specifically my people specifically, my people, my people, and they just bring me joy. And like, I like to talk about black joy, and that's not to say we don't have to talk about black trauma, but as soon as I, I laugh, cry. that's who I am. And that's what my mom does. And my my partner actually, the, the more I've seen him um, cry is from pure joy. I've actually never really seen him cry through his pain. But he's just, he's just, he's an amazing person. And so I like, I like those. Um, yeah, I definitely write for that like holy trinity I was talking about before, the family and the, uh, my partner, my mom, and my sister, will they laugh, will they cry, will they think? But I think I also just like, instead of being like, oh, I write for this audience specifically, I think my ideal like patron, my ideal like audience member is somebody who like comes in with a little bit of curiosity. Like A Million Tiny Pieces is like a big ensemble like docu-comedy, I think is what Jerry Pash called it. And like, um... It's kind of a departure for me. Like most of my work is like asks these really like socio political questions, but like wrapped in genre, wrapped in comedy. So there's that feeling of like coming with your belief system, but like be open to the idea that this is going to challenge it. And if you leave with the same belief system, awesome. Like bend those beliefs and see if they break. But at the very least, I think you like need to meet the work halfway and like listen to the voices. I also kind of love audiences who come in and are open to the idea that like characters can be right and wrong sometimes at the same time. Yeah, I think that's very human. And so that idea of like, I love when I watch an audience like laugh along and cheer for a character and that character says something that's maybe a little offensive and they go, wait, how do I feel about this person now? And they don't recognize they put up with that behavior from their best friends all the time. But for some reason, when it happens in storytelling, it makes them feel a certain way. And so like, I really, I write for an audience that kind of comes in open with those questions and that curiosity to kind of meet it.
Um, you know, I think particularly with Nina Stekos, um, the Latinx community, um, uh, uh, Monk Park, and that I owe a huge debt of gratitude to the, the pioneers, people who held it down, many of whom were part of the Hispanic Civil Rights Project at Church of the Brook. Um, yes, the pioneers in Canada uh, working up there, you know, in isolation for a long time. Um, but also, you know, more broadly speaking, like the theater is my favorite place in the world. It's where I grew up, it's where I came to, to have somewhere to go. And um, there is such a feeling of betrayal sometimes when we were playing the same misogyny on stage, unchecked, into homophobia on stage, unchecked, racism, ableism. And to think that not everybody feels seen and safe under these roofs. And so my audience is my audience that I want to bring in and say, I got you. You're seen, you're safe with me and you can stand up and let us do everything we can. Yeah, how we make how we make these halls uh, sacred for all mm -hmm. as they walk through. It's a powerful, powerful thing. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, a few things to know. We've got 15 minutes allotted for this. We will keep moving because we got to get to Bite Me. We are missing two play, uh, playwrights, Eliana uh, Pipes, uh, who is working on uh, Bite Me right now, and Katie Doe, who did Love You a Long Time Already, who was able to... Nick, I'm sorry. Nick, I'm and who wasn't able to join us, and Nick Green, the book writer of Dr. Silver, A Celebration of Life. Uh, so I did want to uh, bring those names into the space. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes. Inevitably, when you open it up for questions, there is a dramatic pause. And then in the last two minutes, everyone's hands go up. So I'm talking, I'm talking right now so you can get your question ready to go. One thing you should know is we invite curiosity, but sometimes I want you to be aware your curiosity may be met with challenge, meaning sometimes the question you ask may not be the question that needs an answer. And I might say, you know what, thank you for that. We're going to send that question. Thank you for bringing it into space. And any playwright on this panel can pass. They are not obligated to answer the question, all right? Just want to, thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. Just want to put that into the space. But with that being said, are there any questions or comments or offers? Here's the dramatic pause. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right here, yes. How different is it to um, watch your play being performed versus being in the play? I'm going to. Um, I'm going to repeat the question uh, for how round and for our audiences. How different is it to watch your play being performed versus being in the play? Yeah? I mean, I think you two, uh, I, I, I actually would ask Dr. Silver to take that since you all were performing and playing uh, in Dr. Silver. It's so much more relaxing to be active while your play is happening than just to watch it. <laughs> Something to do. I would have never, I did not see that Something answer coming. Something to do. Yeah. Some measure of control. <laughs> um, it also, sometimes playing our own work is a vital part of, of, a, of a workshop thing, which is still kind of figuring out the ebb and flow of the whole suite of the piece. And uh, so it's actually been a really informative and empowering part of this process that we've gotten How about you, Michael? Yeah, um, you know, it's it's really strange. So I, you know, I write all kinds of plays and um, I try to make, you know, for me, the challenge is sort of like each play that has to be sort of different from the last, right? Like, um, I'm interested in like, you know, how can I take, what what's the form of this play gonna be? What does this play need and how do I bring it to that? So for this play, for Abad, um, you know, it's, it's sort of this meta thing that's happening where I'm playing my mother and then also like there's a turn where I sort of have a conversation with her and it's sort of, that's sort of out of body experience. Um, it feels very dangerous and scary to put my body on stage in that way. And like, I'm there, like it's me playing, you know, playing my mother in front of an audience and it's just like, it's almost weirdly like stand up 
you know, but like as my mom, you know, like, <laughs> um, so, and like stand up can be very, you know, can be very scary because it's, you know, it's live theater, right? Like we're in the audience, it's, you know, something goes wrong, you say something wrong, like there's that. But then also like the, the sort of the stakes of this story and of the, of her history, like, um, I'm dealing with topics that are very taboo, you know, that we don't really talk about in, in the Iranian community and in, in our culture. So, um, and also bringing them to go back to your earlier question, like bringing them to spaces where, you know, there, these stories aren't really told. So, you know, it feels like, um, like a great responsibility, but also um, super rewarding to be able to like, take that story, embody it, you know, to, to bring in folks like writing for, you know, for queer Iranians, um, you know, this, this, this is like she's welcoming an American audience in, but when, when there are Iranians in the audience, when there are queer people in the audience, it's sort of like, there's just a secret language that happens. Everyone's in on it, but there's like, okay, you know, this part of the show is, is for you. And, and performing it is really special because I get to sort of be in on that with the community, uh -huh. you know, together sort of experiencing this. Thank you. Go ahead. He just made me think of something on the back I just wanted to share. Just in saying that, what I feel like is what's brilliant about all of these pieces, and especially like pieces of color or like things like that done by people of color. So when I was little, I saw myself in Frazier. I really, <laughs> right? I, I just got him at a very young age. And I think what's so cool about these pieces, and I saw your piece last night, and saw your mother, beautiful and brilliant is that it allows people who are not Iranian or black to see themselves in an uh, Iranian, am I Yeah, yeah, yeah. Iranian and black show. So I saw myself in this cis male, straight, you know, older white man, and perhaps an older cis male white man could see himself in this 28 year old black woman. Come on, yeah. Like that yeah. is yeah. the magic that I've experienced forever, and I just want to share that magic. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. We got 10 minutes on the clock. Let me see hands. 10 minutes on the clock. I got a question here. I got a question here. Give me one second. I'm just checking the room. All right. We'll start here. Yes. Uh, off of that, actually, what comes up for you all when you're writing a character that you don't identify with, has an identity that you feel like is outside of your own? What comes up for you when you are writing a character you don't identify with? Let's start with you, Christine. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, accountability and anxiety. Like both of those things just sit together. Come on. <laughs> Does anybody have anything different than accountability and anxiety? <laughs> That's all well said. Yeah. Go ahead, Spencer. I was just gonna say, I mean, I, I for somebody who writes mostly women and like and people of color, it's like get as quickly as possible fill the room with the folks whose experiences that reflects, and make sure that authenticity, I think, is also incredibly important as far as that's concerned. Anxiety, accountability, and authenticity. Ooh, Thank you. Eight. All eights. Zero eights, right here, <laughs> question. What gave you the courage to be self-employed? <laughs> <laughs> What gave you the courage to be self-employed? Uh, how about our <laughs> sisters down here? What gave you the courage to be writers, to choose this life? It, that's a wonderful question, and it's a question I ask myself literally every day. <laughs> every time I have to go to the dentist. <laughs> we were very lucky. Uh, to, our parents were both uh, full-time freelance musicians, and, so, and we were raised in Stratford, Ontario, which is a theater town, and our parents were in the pit band there. All of our friends, their parents worked in the theater. So we came up in an ecosystem where it seemed very normal and responsible. Like you, everyone had a house and a job in theater. And that hasn't been my experience as an adult, but um, it is nice <laughs> to have it imprinted in the formative years. Right. Not, yet. Not, yet. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Yes. Yes. You're right. Yeah. We have the gift of a very functional and abundant life being modeled for us. I always find people always, uh, they're, they're always uh, surprised. I don't know, I feel like I had a lot of great examples. That was like, mm -hmm. I knew artists who were making a living, you know? Mm -hmm. My high school theater teacher said, you yourself are an oil well and you'll never run dry. 
And so that was the courage, right? To go, you know what? I want to create. That's the life I want to live. And when it means that I got to hustle and I got to hold job A, B, C, and D, and E, and then F on the side, you know, like all of those jobs, I'm going to do it for the art, which I think we've heard how much the art is important to all of these people. We have a question here. Yes? Hi. I'm a 30 year veteran of comic time. Okay. Yes. Um, I can see your one app showing, not until eight, because you need that visual for that. But uh, do you have a plan for that? A 30 year veteran of Comic Con. It's a question for Spencer. Can yes. you repeat what the question Are is? You to, or have you planned or thought about opening a first app at Comic Con? Have you thought about your first? Got it. Comic Con. It's a million oh, tiny pieces. Tetris. It's a game. It it's, seems like I you're getting some advertising information. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? A million tiny pieces takes over all the Comic Cons. Uh, we got time for one or two more questions. One or two more questions. Anything you have not heard, you want to hear right here. Yes. Um, this is a question for Naomi. I, I thought your device of repeating certain phrases in all of the um, different sections with all of the different couples was very interesting. Why? Can you, can you talk about the choice to make that device at all? Question for Naomi, how to roll a blunt has a scene where our characters repeat things. What's What are you thinking about? How'd you get there? I just say the same thing over and over and over hey, in my hey. personal life. My partner would be like, you already told me that. But, you know, like, to quote, um, you know, it's like, that's what I do. And I think that, and that's what my mom does. And that's what our group of college friends do. Like from when we got there freshman year, like, our little community would have these phrases that we would bounce back to each other. And I felt like it was deeply rooted in respect and honor because what they say over and over and really trying to like hone in a point, but try not to be overbearing because of the comedy that will kind of undercut that tension. But it's literally how I talk and there are quotes that I have like from Maya Angelou that I just replay over and over. I, like my favorite books I'll just read over and over. My favorite music, when I'm writing a play, I listen to the same song over and over. There's a soundtrack for the play because it's a soundtrack for the characters and a soundtrack for that time in which I'm telling the story. And the repetition just, it's, it's, it's needle to thread. It, it just really helps tightly weave the story. So it's just, it's like, yeah, it's not a musical, but it is a musical. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. With the last five minutes, I will uh, offer, uh, I have one last question for you all. Uh, it's one of those large, big ones, so you can take your time. Uh, uh, whenever uh, I, you're working, when I'm working with a group of collaborators, we do Rose, Seed, Thorn, uh, you know, that classic one there. Uh, and I just want to hear your seed. I just want to hear what you wish for. What are you wishing for the American theater? Uh, what are you wishing for the industry? What are you wishing for? Um, it can be simple, it can be large. What is your wish for the American theater, for the industry, for where we're headed? What is your wish? Uh, we won't go down the line because I imagine it will come to you when it does. So whoever wants to go first, you can. There's still plenty of time, so you can think. I think that the, my biggest experience this week has been just the joy of connecting with people, new people. And so I think my wish uh, it sort of takes me back to I think the first thing I talked about today, but it is that like we find more opportunities after having been apart for a while and in, in such a fraught time to be together and find the delight and joy of connecting with and being surprised by one another. And I think there's a danger of reemerging from this tiny group in Washington. <laughs> I wish. Yeah. No, I think abundance was the word that literally like came to mind because I think there is this sense of like I thought we I think we all thought like okay well at least theater can be like you can't take away being in a group and then it actually <laughs> was taken away from us and so I, I do hope that we realize what we have just by being able to be here even with masks on and that idea of like if, if there's anything sitting on our heart anymore, like get rid of that filter, whatever that doubt is that's keeping it, 
inside and, and share that. I think like now more than ever, for sure. Yeah, yeah, abundance, abundance, for sure. Like I feel like there's this idea in the theater that there can be in, in a season, in a particular theater season, like w room for one, you know, one person of color, right? Like there's what we like we've done our black play this season. We're good. Like that's it. Like we're good. We have checked the box. You know, there's one Iranian playwright. We've done it, and like we're we're good. So like, and I feel like that's a really um, dangerous paradigm because you know we are like first of all, who's who's making those decisions, right? But also like, how do we sort of open? How do we come to theater with openness? And how do we sort of um, like what are the stories that we're telling? What are the stories that we're lifting up? Uh, if, if there's only room for one, right, and then you're sort of like pitting people from in community uh, against each other, um, it's not really, like it doesn't really make sense. So I think like, yeah, just like a spirit of abundance, of openness. Uh, and I've definitely felt that this week, I felt that with, with my collaborators, but like how do, we, how do we bring that more widely, more broadly to, to the theater spaces that we're in? in mind just with your beautiful question and your one of the answers you made early on I realize now I just, I just had my son in my town doing this and I realize I'm using the check I'm going to get from this to fund this because I had to bring my whole family out he's only four months old and I was like I want to do this forever I have to do this forever he also needs help with this <laughs> so I'm like how can we actually make this a living way so that when you tell someone you're an artist they're not like <laughs> like, I wouldn't be like, I'm an artist. I'm like, oh, good for you. So, like, just like a dentist or anyone else, like a living wage and health insurance, and just like, so it's not so fearful for other young people to get into it because it should be, it's such a beautiful profession, and I think it should be um, compensated as such. You know, I can't believe that that's what you said because I, what, I, what I thought actually was universal basic income. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, you know, for a brief moment uh, in the pandemic, Canadians got SERB. Remember yeah. SERB? SERB was, was so great. <laughs> effectively universal basic income. It was $2,000 a month, and I think you could go for up to six months. Um, and the renaissance of art from people whose financial situation precluded them, people with children who can't afford to participate in the art sector, people with disabilities, people who are not from privileged economic backgrounds who uh, really are going to take a paycheck. And just that moment when that pressure was lifted, the abundance that came from them, and the, the voices that we would get to hear if everybody can use for that, with mm -hmm. universal basic income and standard child care. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's what I thought. <laughs> so yeah. I guess we're thinking the same thing. Thank yeah. you. Thank you all so much. I know we at South Coast Repertory wish you uh, radical joy, we wish you radical sustainable joy. However, that joy needs to be sustained, whether that means you are in your penthouse in New York, or whether you are in the mountain shack in Vermont, we wish you radical sustainable joy. Thank you for being present. Thank you all for showing up. Thank you on Howl Round.